Which keeps it exciting, doesn't it? It's good to see you today. We, you know, Tim just talked about just coming back from a marriage retreat. We had a phenomenal time both weekends, and I'm glad you were part of it. If you were part of it, if not, it's get signed up for next year because it's always worth the journey. It's always worth the trip. It was a great, great time of the Lord. Today, we're starting a brand new sermon series on uh, the secret place, which is taken out of Matthew 5, where Jesus talks about the secret place. We'll look at those passages in just a moment. I know Tim said a little something a while ago about the blue stickies that were, or yellow, whatever color might be on your bulletin there today. We're going to be taking these at the end of the service, and these will be prayer requests, specific requests that you have, that you want to pray for, you want the church to be praying for. Uh, there'll be a time if you need some more, they'll be on the altar here. You want to come and pray for them before you put them on the wall. What we're going to ask you to do is to take those and at a certain time towards the invitation at the end of the message, uh, guest, non-guest, member, non-member, whoever, you have something that's on your heart, it's a burden. We're going to be going into about 10 weeks of about, a, well, we'll just call it a season of prayer. Lifting a specific request, needs. I believe that God answers prayer. The Bible says we have not because we ask not. So we're going to be getting very specific with the Lord. And we'll be asking you to take these prayer requests, whether it's for the church, for a family need, or a family member, or finances, whatever it might be, health issues, whatever those prayer requests are, we're going to get real specific with the Lord. I want you to pin those down. You don't have to write all the details. The Lord knows what the details are. But write them on those, those notes. You can write two or three. If you have more than that, you want to put on our prayer wall. Uh, we put up our, our wailing wall, our western wall over here on, on the I Believe sticker. I want to ask you to take these, all right, and then go over to the prayer wall here. Uh, you can come pray over here at the altar at your seat, and then come over here and post them somewhere on the wall, all right? And uh, we'll come back through later and make sure they don't fall off with some scotch tape or something. But put them up on this wall. We're going to be praying for these. Uh, during the week, our staff can come in and out of here. I'll come in and out of here. I'll pray for some each time I come in. I'll ask them to do the same. When you come in for church, as early as y'all get here, right? You'll have time to come over here and maybe pray for a few of the needs are on the wall. You don't even have to know who requested it, all right? Just come in and take some time. Wednesday night when you come in before the service, come over here. After the service, you may want to come over and spend a few minutes as well. But let's just fill this thing up with needs, all right? And let's take these next nine to ten weeks and let's be real specific about praying for these needs and lifting them up to the Lord. And I bet you anything, if I were a betting man, that uh, we'll see God do some great and mighty things that'll blow our minds in different ways. Also, we're going to ask you to take one of these prayer bands. They're on the altar as well. During that time when you come up to uh, put your prayer request on the wall, grab one of these prayer bands, wear it for the next nine or ten weeks. All right? they, they hold up in the shower. You don't have to wear them in the shower. But they'll hold up in the shower. Put them on. Some of you may still have your old band that talked about the unashamed believer. We're sharing our faith. Reminds us to always be a constant witness for Jesus. Uh, I've added one more to mine now. It's the unashamed warrior because that's what prayer is. So be sure and pick up a prayer band and there you go. <laughs> Wear it. If anybody asks you about it, it's a good response to say, hey, our church is entering a real season of prayer. You have someone you want us to pray for? And then let them share a prayer and pray for them there at the same time. Can be at the counter, you know. If you're, if you're in the front of the line at Walmart, I'm at the back of the line, make a short prayer. <laughs> but whatever you do, be sure and pray for, lift them up to the Lord and see what God does. Because I believe that the Lord answers prayer still today. Nothing's changed with him. And the reason he doesn't answer many times is because we just don't ask. Jesus is talking about prayer in Matthew chapter, chapter 5 when he says this. When you pray... You are, by the way, when you pray, remember that part of it. You're not to be like the hypocrites. They love to stand and pray in the synagogues and on the street corners so that they may be seen by men. Truly, I say to you, they have their reward in full. But you, when you pray, go into the inner room. Close your door and pray to your father who is in secret. And your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And when you are praying, do not use meaningless repetition as the Gentiles do. For they suppose that they'll be heard for their many words. So do not be like them. 
For your father knows what you have need before you ask him. Now, this is a really important passage, just briefly. There's a lot that Jesus says about prayer, and there's a lot that Jesus modeled with his own life for his disciples about prayer. But I think this is an important part as we start our series today on prayer of the secret place. He mentioned several times about when you're in that secret place with your father, the father who sees you there in the secret place, he'll reward you for what's done in secret. And then he gives some instructions about prayer. Let me share with you a quote. You know, uh, there's two quotes I want to, one's on the, be on the, the overhead that's behind me and the other one I, I don't have up. But these are by, both by great men of God who wrote m- much on prayer and have several books each on prayer. S.D. Gordon said this. He said, the greatest thing one can do for God and man is pray. It's not the only thing, but it is the chief thing. The great people of the earth today are people who pray. I do not mean those who talk about prayer, nor those who say they believe in prayer. You know, you are those who can explain about prayer, but I mean those people who take the time to pray. Therein lies the great secret who actually take the time to pray. Now I've grown up in Baptist churches. Baptists do a lot of this. They talk about prayer a lot. They say they believe in prayer. They can explain to you a lot about prayer, but they don't take a lot of time to pray. It's like, you know, going to all the seminars on hunting or fishing and never going hunting or fishing. Amen. We talk about prayer. We say we believe in prayer. Listen to what Ian Bounds says. He's written many books on prayer. He said, what the church needs today is not more machinery or better. Not new organizations or more novel or unique methods. And he tells us what the church needs today men whom the Holy Ghost can use. What kind of men are those? Men of prayer, mighty men of prayer. I think when we begin to really get a grip on what prayer is, we'll understand those comments a little bit more, hopefully even a little bit more as we get towards the end of the study. Sometimes our idea of prayer is is, is to go in and somehow win God over to what my needs are, somehow persuade God to, to do things my way. And that's not what prayer at all is. By the way, in regard to that, God is more sensitive to your needs than you are. God knows what your needs are. In fact, you think you know what your needs are many times when God knows what your real needs really are. Prayer, as we study it, and as we look at over these next nine, 10 weeks, we're gonna see it is a great mystery, but at the same time, it is quite understandable. It's a great mystery in that it moves the hand of God. It's quite understandable that God has called us to pray. Well, I'm going to start the study by giving just quick three things on what I would call prayers that die. And then I want to tell you five reasons why we pray. But first of all, let's start with these, these prayers that die because Jesus talks about these, the prayers that die in this passage of scripture from Matthew chapter six. These, these are common problems. If we'll take the time to look at them that a lot of people have when, when it comes to prayer, you know, uh, but ultimately as we look at these prayers that die, you'll see that they're, it's usually misguided motives. And we have misguided motives. That's a good way to guarantee that your prayers are not going to be answered, you know, or that you're going to be extremely empty and discouraged in your life, or somehow, you know, you're going to get out of sorts in your fellowship with God. In Matthew 6, it says, when you pray, don't be like the hypocrites. They love to stand and pray in the synagogues on the street corners so they may be seen, seen of men. Truly, they have their reward. That's the kind of prayers I will talk to you about, these fictitious prayers that are prayed by these men. This fictitious prayer, number one, we'll call it the unprayer. And this is where we read a while ago with a quote that people talk about praying, but they don't pray. They study prayer, but they don't pray. They can explain prayer, but they don't pray. Jesus said in Matthew 6, that first part of that verse, chapter, verse 5 says, when you pray. The idea is kind of obvious here that we pray, right? In fact, he says it several times through that, that passage. When you pray, don't be this way. When you pray, be this way. When you pray. So the idea is, is not if you pray, or whenever you pray, or whenever you feel like praying, the basic starting point is rarely achieved by a lot of people is that we start praying. And when we do pray, then he gives us some instructions. But do you realize in the modern church today that 25%, one fourth of the attenders of the modern church today say that they never pray? They never pray. How how can a person really even expect to have some kind of walk to God? I mean, think of all the ridiculous analogies we could come up with. We could say, to never pray, and I'm a believer and a Christian, 
That's like a football team that never practices. I know some of you are thinking about the Texans this moment. Just hold on there. <laughs> or an orchestra that doesn't tune his instruments. It just doesn't make any sense. The farmer who calls himself a farmer, but he never plants any crops. The artist who claims to be a great artist, but never buys any paint. The sales rep who, who says he's a sales rep for his company, but he never calls on any clients. That, that's the same analogy we could look at today. And by the way, to never do something is the worst way to get better at it. You don't get good at something unless you're doing that something. I know a lot of it is because in this modern world that we live in where we're so surrounded by everything and the comforts of the world and, and, and the technology of this modern society that we live in, we get so wrapped up in doing and in being places and getting involved in things that all our activities are nonstop. They overlap each other. You know, they, they, they keep us about two days and 10 minutes behind all the time, it seems. And I believe part of that reason is because we don't stop to do the most important thing. We're satisfied with the unprayer. We believe in prayer. We talk about prayer. We may shoot an occasional prayer. The, the second prayer that Jesus refers to here is what we would call the phony prayer. He said, when you pray, don't be like the hypocrites. They, they love to stand to pray in the synagogues to be seen by men. Now, that's, the, that's that phony prayer. He says, they have their reward. That's the prayer to, to impress somebody. But isn't that the way a lot of times it goes, especially with public praying? Preachers do this a lot. Sunday school teachers do this a lot. Elders and deacons do this a lot. It's really the prayer that's just prayed so that you know that, you, that somebody hears it well. You, you change your tone, the words are inflected in such a way, your vocabulary changes. It's that thou great and mighty God, our Holy Father, sovereign God of the universe, attend our prayer at this time May thy mighty great hand pour out thy greatest blessings upon thy people who love thee. And on and on it goes. You know how that works. I think a lot of people have been guilty of that at one time or another. You always love that guy to pray over the, 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 the lunch. <laughs> you know it's cold. <laughs> you know, it, it just goes on. They want to have their prayer time and they want to show it off for everybody else in the room. That, that's just Jesus is referring to this. And basically in, in the modern terminology, he's saying, don't be a showboater. Don't be a showboater, you know? You're just trying to get recognition, get other people's approval. If that's the reason you pray, then fine. What Jesus is saying, well, oh, that's fine. If that's what you want to do, enjoy your reward. You have it in full. What's the reward? Oh, that's marvelous. Pat you on the back. That, that's it. That's all you're going to get out of that deal. You're not going to get answered prayer. You're not going to see God move. You're not going to know the intimacy of fellowship with God. You're going to miss it completely, but you'll have your reward in full. But Jesus said, but if that which is done in secret, when you pray, you really learn how to pray. You learn how to be an effective prayer warrior. Then there's another reward that comes to the great hand of God, that precious reward, one of just being in the very presence of God and knowing that he hears you and he loves you and he walks with you. Now that doesn't mean that we never pray in public. We just don't showboat in public. Jesus prayed in public often. He would pray as he would bless the, the bread and the fish, and the loaves or the miracles, you know. He prayed in, in, in public at the tomb of Lazarus. But it wasn't this, this pairs of hypocrisy, all right? Those were, those were the phony prayers. The third kind of prayer that I think is mentioned and referenced here is this frivolous prayer. You know, where it goes into this prayer for repetition's sake. Just a, when you do, you're praying, do not use meaningless repetition as the Gentiles do, for they suppose that they will be heard for their many words. Verse 7, it talks about this. That's where a lot of people are in, in the world we live in. They think that, that, that it's just all about the words. And if we say the words and we say them often enough, then God will attend our prayers. I mean, you probably won't like what the illustration I'm going to use here, but it's, it, there's a popular Christian radio station here in town that calls prayer, Pray Down at High Noon or something like that. And that at high noon, all Christians across the radio listening audience are supposed to pray the Lord's Prayer. Well, that's the very thing Jesus is talking against. All right. He didn't give us the Lord's Prayer to pray that prayer repetitiously. In fact, everything he's saying in that, about that prayer and about praying says that's not what we do. It's not just praying model prayers. You know, the model prayer means it's, that is exactly what it is. It's not like the model on the runway. This is the pretty prayer. All right. It's the model prayer. In other words, this is a, this is a, this is a, a type. This is a, a means. You can learn how to pray effectively by looking at this prayer 
just taking it, meditating on it, and seeing what's there, our Father, there has to be a relationship, which art in heaven. He's over all things. How will be them? Good, real prayer has that part of, of worship and, you know, appreciation. You know, thy kingdom come, thy will be, which is the heart of prayer, the will of God. So all that was just given as a model of how to pray. He says, you're not going to be heard because you're just repeating a bunch of words over and over and over again, even though they may be Bible words. It's frivolous. Now, when he talked to the Jewish culture, that's who he's speaking of here, and he's a rabbi, there were prayers that were prayed by the Jews that were supposed to be prayed in such a way, not as a frivolous prayer. There was the Shema. The Shema was that prayer you probably heard the Jews say that it starts out, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one God, or he's one Lord. That's taken out of Deuteronomy chapter 6 and Deuteronomy chapter 11. There's an abbreviated form of Deuteronomy chapter 6, but it just, it, it's, a, it's a prayer to, to God and a recognition of God over all things. And then there was another what was called the 18 recitations. I don't know the Hebrew terminology for that. But it had to do 18 prayers that would be prayed by the Jews on various occasions. Whereas the shame would be prayed in the synagogue mostly in times of gathering, you know, the 18 prayers were prayed by faithful Jews in the morning, in the afternoon, and the evening. And they also had a little abbreviated version of it. But they were to be said every day. Whereas one would be more used in the formalized worship with other Jews, these 18 prayers could be prayed in different situations and whether you're traveling or eating or whatever it might be. And they would be prayed during the day. Now, most Jews would pray faithfully uh, about three times a day. There would be the third, the sixth, and the ninth hours, 9 a.m., 12 noon, and 3 p.m. But these were prayers that were supposed to be prayed in a certain, they weren't just supposed to be ritual prayers, all right? In fact, there's three ways that those ritual prayers, even though they might look at them that way, were to be, with the attitude they had to be prayed. One was that attitude of sincerity, which the devout Jew who really loved God, who really wanted God's will to be done in life, they would pray these prayers as an act of worship. They would pray them to glorify God. They, you know, they, they, and as they prayed them, they would think about the words and the content and there'd be sincerity and worship involved. But then many times these prayers would be prayed with indifference. You know, they just went through the words. They just kind of said them, mumbled them, went, this, you know, kind of spit out the syllables, but, you know, there was no worship, no commitment involved. Then there were those who, as Jesus is referring to the, to the, the, the Pharisees who would pray it with a great deal of pride. I mean, it, was, it wasn't anything to do with humility, had nothing to do with worship. It was being heard, being seen praying them. People recognize me. I can say these prayers. I can recite these prayers word by word. Every enunciation of every syllable is perfect. You know, it's just, it, it's just I, I can do it good. Look at me. And that's what he's saying. You know, these folks, they're going to get their reward. It wasn't only the Jews, though, that had prayers. Even the pagan cultures, the Greeks, the Romans, they had prayers that were, were, were written out that they would repeat and recite. They believed that they had to be formally done. They believed that there was even a magical kind of mysterious uh, influence involved. Especially with the Greeks, they had all these mythological pagan deities that they worshipped. Each one had some control over some different aspect of nature. So whatever the need was, that would depend on which God that you would pray to. And then they would pray the prayers related to that God and they would recite them over and over and over again so as to get the attention of heaven. Jesus said, you will not be heard because you're saying a lot of words. But they thought that there was some kind of what we might even refer to as an incantation. You know, that, that's not what the Bible talks about perseverance in prayer. That, that's not what it's dealing with. Jesus applauds being persevering in your prayer life. All right. But this is just merely uh, some kind of idea of repeating stuff, some kind of precise formula, some kind of incantation that would gain the favor of the gods. And Jesus is obviously speaking against that. Let me put a, here's a word you might understand more clearly in regard to this new age concept. It's your mantra. You pray it over and over and repeat your mantra over and over. Jesus says, that is meaningless repetition. Meaningless repetition. You can see an illustration of that in the Old Testament, Mount Carmel. Remember Elijah's there? All the false prophets are there. The challenge is given. Whosoever God answers by fire, they both build their altars. Elijah's got his altar. He's got, his, he's got the calf on it. The false prophets built their altar. They've got their bull on it and their calf on it. They've slaughtered them. The blood has soaked the altar. And they start praying, the pagans do. 
and they're chanting and they're praying. They went go, they, they're crying out from the very morning until noon, they're screaming, they're pleading, they're begging, they're running around, they're cutting themselves with their own swords. They're trying somehow to, ins to spark or ignite the God of Baal to answer their prayers and it's not happening. And the humorous part about that passage is, it, it, you can see, you know, Elijah's probably sitting over his arms crossed and his legs crossed, just, it, he's mocking them. You know, the more they get chant, he said, hey, hey guys, good job, but you should probably do it louder. Maybe he can't hear you. Maybe your God is deaf. So pray a little. And the they're, they're chanting louder and louder and louder. So it could be he's not home. Maybe he's gone on a long journey. I, I think it's the, the living Bible says, maybe he's in the restroom. He's gone to the toilet your God has. He'll be back in a little bit when he gets out of the bathroom. He may be having problems. <laughs> and you see him chide them for the foolishness of uh, of praying and, and, and the frivolity of praying in this kind of form, thinking that that's going to get through, and it doesn't. And Elijah makes his way over to the other altar. It's been doused with water. It's been completely waterlogged, and he prays a very short prayer unto the God of heaven and the fire falls. What was he doing? If you study that prayer, you'll see he was praying in a way that would honor God. He was humble before God and he was praying according to the will of God for that moment. And that's all the things we're gonna be talking about more and more in this whole series that deals with prayer. But you know, this is not new. The, the world knows about prayer. People talk about praying a lot, but they don't understand the biblical method of praying. The beautiful thing about Christians is God desires an intimate conversation with us. God desires us to be in his presence and to walk with him. And in praying, he's not testing our faith. He's, he's joining in union with us. And, it's, and Jesus said, it's not words that count and it's, and it's not even endurance that counts. You need to understand what real prayer is. Now the Buddhist, if you looked at there, you know, the, the, the Buddhist in praying, they spin wheels. And on the wheels are written prayers, believing that with each turn of the wheel, that sends the prayer up to their God. Well, we do the same thing in different ways. And the Catholic Church, you know, somehow feels that, you know, you, you take your prayers and as you make your request, you, you light a candle. And the, 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 the basic meaning of lighting the candle is that it's, it's kind of like the, the, the altar and the incense as the aroma would rise. Well, what comes off your prayer over this candle is that it will arise and take it into heaven and God will answer it there. Rosaries, you know, this, that's, that's not a biblical thing. Now, you may be a Catholic, well, I have a rosary, but it's not a biblical thing. You say, well, where do rosaries come from? Rosaries came into the Catholic church via Buddhism. You know, and they came into Buddhism by the way of the Muslims in Spain back in the Middle Ages. If you're familiar with Muslims, you'll know they have that same kind of bead structure for pray. And it's just carried, we just hung a cross of it and took it in the Catholic church. So we've, we've misunderstood about prayer a lot. Evangelical churches somehow think that repeating certain prayers or saying certain prayers at certain times in certain ways will get God to move in some kind of way. One thing, if you study what scripture says about prayer and you look at all these things that Jesus is, is saying right here in regard to prayer, you find out very quickly that the reward he talks about here, that God rewards those, the reward is reserved for those who seek God's heart who want to know God and are not seeking his attention. There's a lot of people just seeking God's attention. They do it by repetition, by words, and, or, you know, and, and think that somehow that, that gets them closer. Or tack the name of Jesus. Okay, all, I ask all this in Jesus' name, amen. Like that's some little magic talisman that you hang on the end of your prayer. And you miss the mark. Because what it means to pray in the name of Jesus has to do with praying a prayer that is I would say what is significantly similar to everything that Jesus stands for. To pray in his name means that I'm, I'm bringing my prayers to you, Father, because I believe what I'm praying to you has, is in accordance with everything that Jesus is and Jesus desires for my life. It has to do with praying according to the will of God. You say, well, how do I know what the will of God is? We'll talk about that. You need to come back, keep coming back for this series. We'll talk about these things. But praying is important. I'm going to give you just briefly, and then we'll, we want to spend some time to, to pray and take our prayer request to the Lord. But just quick five reasons why, why we pray and, and why we seek the Lord. One is, is the obvious thing. God commands us to. Throughout the, you know, out, out through scripture, it's obvious that God's called us to pray. Even here, several times, Jesus, when you pray, when you pray, when you pray. It's expected, in other words. 
In Luke 18, Jesus is talking to them and he gives them a parable, but in telling them a parable, he says, I'm just telling you this parable to show you that at all times we ought to pray and we shouldn't lose heart. Why? Because we have a relationship with God. And if God be for us, who can be against us? So what do we do? We don't get discouraged, don't live in stress, don't live in fear, don't live in defeat, don't live with doubt. You pray. You seek God, you, you go to God with the needs that are in your life. Ephesians 6 talks about the, the armor. One of our sermons will do about how to pray in the armor and what's that mean to pray? Because the whole armor of God of Ephesians 6 is dealing with the issue of we put on this armor, not so we can run out in the world and do battle with the devil. He says, you're getting ready to do your spiritual conflict, but you have to, you have to, be, you have to be dressed for, for that. And he says, so that when you put on this armor, it's with all prayer and petitions that you're praying all the times with this in view, you're gonna be with all perseverance and petition for the saints. What's he saying? You put on the armor of God for prayer. We'll talk about that just briefly, just one moment. In, in 1 Timothy 2, here's the, here's the word from God. First of all, I urge that entreaties and prayers, petitions and thanksgiving be made on behalf of all men. This is the expectation from Father. In verse eight of that same chapter, he says, therefore I want men in every place to pray, lifting up holy hands without wrath or dissension. These are just a few of a multitude of scriptures that talk to us about talking to God, spending time with God, laying out our heart before the Lord, praying for others, that there's supplication, there's adoration. In lift group studies, in the morning studies and in the evening studies, and you see the, the, the needle lift stickers as Tim mentioned, that doesn't mean these are Uber drivers, okay? <laughs> They're not looking for getting your, it's, you need a lift in your spiritual life. We're gonna be going deeper into these messages each time we meet in lift group. In fact, this lift group, I think the, the night group start, maybe next Sunday we'll start with, with this portion. Uh, I, I put a little addendum on the lift group and said, cover this material. It deals with, if you're a person who hasn't been praying, or maybe you had difficulty in getting that daily discipline of having a prayer time, take some time with this study tonight and let's talk about specifics on how we get started, how we really get serious. If we've lost it, we haven't come back to it, perhaps we haven't been praying like we used to pray, then how to get back again and how to redevelop and, and what that prayer time is really supposed to be like. A lot of times with prayer, most people approach it what I call the acts, A-C-T-S method. And what acts means is adoration, confession, thanksgiving, and supplication, all right? That our prayers make up that, it's, it's adoration. It involves that once we start worshiping God, God starts revealing our sin to us where we're missing it in our relationship with us. And we let him deal with us and correct us in that. So confession takes place. After that, there's that continued thanksgiving. And then from there, it's supplication, a praying for needs and interceding for people and, and just dealing with issues of life in general. That's ACTS, adoration, confession, thanksgiving, supplication. So they'll talk, we'll talk about more of that in the lift groups as well. But the idea is here, this is what the Lord expects of us. This is, we're children of God. And if we're his children, he's our father. So we talk to daddy, all right? We spend time with daddy. We, we wanna communicate with daddy. I tell you, one of the greatest miserable things right now for me is my mom passed away at Christmas this last year, and I'm sure Phil and others can attest to this. I mean, I, you know, I at least talk to mom once a day, and you, I mean, it's just starting to pick up the phone and knowing that, you know, I, I can't call her now. But that's just a physical picture of how it should be in our spiritual life. I need to talk to dad today. I need to talk to heavenly father today. I need to get on the line with him and spend some time with him and communicate with our heavenly father. Why? Because we're his children and he's our father. So we're commanded. But that leads me to this next part, which is deals with this issue of compassion, that we know God intimately. That's what real prayer really is. I spend time with the father. I speak to him. I allow him to speak to me. It's communication. It's fellowship. That's what the desire of the Lord is. I love this quote from John MacArthur. He made this statement when he said, hey, contrary to much emphasis in the evangelical church today, true prayer, like true worship, centers on God's glory, not on man's need. It is not simply to lay claim on God's promises, much less make demands of him, but to acknowledge his sovereignty and to see the display of his glory and to obey his will. So when I go to the Father in prayer, it's, it's an issue of love first and foremost. There's a love relationship that's been established. I love God. 
Well, how do I love God? The Bible says because I love God because he first loved me. And I tend to believe that a lot of people don't comprehend this because we have a lot of people in churches today who don't know God. Let me say it one more time. I believe that a lot of people in modern churches today don't understand this because they don't know God. We love God because he first loved us. What's that mean? There's a time in our life Jesus said must happen. He says, if you're going to see the kingdom of heaven, you must be born again. And a lot of people, they don't want to come to that climactic moment of their life when they give their heart to Jesus, when they make that real surrender. But Jesus is the one, not the Baptists, not the Catholics, not the Methodists. He said, you must be born again. All right, not the evangelicals, Jesus. You're going to have to have this initial experience of salvation. And what happens at that moment? I lay down my sin. I confess my sin. I submit to Jesus as my Savior and my Lord. I have a new life. Jesus put it this way. You repent or you perish. In other words, you turn from that and turn to him or you die. And so now what happens is that he comes in. Romans 5 says that at that moment that I have faith in Jesus Christ, that he puts inside me his very love. Romans chapter 5. He has given to his spirit and he has given us his love. And so I have now a love for God. How did I get that? Because he first loved me. If he hadn't loved me, I wouldn't love him. I wouldn't know anything about his love if he hadn't loved me. But he loved me. He sent his son to die for me. He sent his word to me. He sent the gospel. He sent preachers. He sent people who prayed for me. God loves me. I don't know about you. You may think God hates you, but hey, God likes me a lot. All right, he loves me. He goes beyond just liking me. Now, sometimes he's not happy with what I've done. Don't look at me that way. You know what I'm talking about. And that's when I come back to God. And this is where, that's why prayer is a necessity because it's in prayer. And he says, okay, Joe, that was a foul up. You shouldn't have said that to your wife. Or you shouldn't have said that to that guy. You shouldn't have done that. That was, a, that was bad behavior, son. And it doesn't show what we're like and what Jesus, is, your, your brother's like. And it doesn't show what I'm like as your father. And it definitely doesn't demonstrate the power of the Holy Spirit. So let's get that straight. Nobody ever had those kind of conversations with God? Yes, if we're going on with it. So there's this element of prayer that's important in our life and our commitment and our compassion to the Lord Jesus Christ is that we're, we're enjoying that love relationship with him. And it's all about that. It's compassion. But third part of that is, is, is commitment. If I'm going to walk with God in any kind of deep level, am I going to mature, you know, uh, if I'm going to have a deep walk with God, that's going to get past this, you know, this issue of just status quo. To be obedient disciples of Jesus, to experience the fullness of our fellowship and our communion with God, and to open the floodgates of God's blessings, we must, believers must pray. It's not going to happen if we don't spend time with God. That's why it's important that we come back to these times like sermon series where we refresh ourselves and remind ourselves and stir ourselves to get back to the place to, to pray, to know more about prayer, to understand it more clearly, to know how to pray. I mean, the disciples, that, that's a good question. They said to Jesus, teach us how to pray. So that's what we're involved in. But we can't be involved in it if we're not feeling some kind of conviction of the fact that we don't pray when we've been commanded to, when it's our love relationship is dependent upon, our compassion with the Father, and there's no commitment. Martin Lloyd-Jones Jones wrote a great uh, series of messages and his studies on the Sermon of the Mount, great theologian, but he made this one little simple statement. He said, man is at his greatest and his highest when he's upon his knees and he comes face to face with God. When are you at your greatest? When are you at your highest? When you're in the presence of God on your face. When your heart is open to him and you're allowing God to work in your life. That's when you're at your greatest. The fourth reason we pray, I mentioned just a while ago, and we'll talk about more in a couple of weeks, has to do that we are in a conflict. Ephesians 6 says, put on the armor of God, and having done all, once you've armed yourself, put on the, all the elements of the armor. He says, you stand praying. We fail to realize so often, you know, the, the reality of the spiritual world, the spiritual arena that's all around us. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, they're present, right? but also present are angels, also present are demons, also present is the devil. There's a lot going on around us today. There's a lot goes around us every day that we just don't see because we have these physical eyes and we're not opening our spiritual eyes. It's in prayer 
that God amazingly opens our eyes to really see what's going on. I can't tell you how many times over the years I've been conflicted or confused about something and just couldn't realize why it's something, why something, why, why, when, where, why is all this happening? Until I got with God and God began to speak to my heart. Sit down, shut up, turn off my, my trying to figure things out and say, God, I need you and I need direction from you and I need to get this, I need to figure this out. Uh, I, you know, most of us think we can figure, figure it all out ourselves, but friends, we can't. We'll never figure it out in the spiritual arena without direction from God. And we'll deal with that, that element of it in a few more weeks. But the fifth and last reason I want to talk to you about briefly is consequences. If we pray, it brings results. It is God's method that he has chosen in his own divine wisdom to accomplish his will. We can do a lot of things for God, we'll see, but they must start with prayer. That's why we say all, many, many times, prayer is the chief thing. I can be about witnessing, but if I'm gonna do it effectively, I need to be filled with this Holy Spirit. I need to be in tune with this word, and I need to be listening to the Holy Spirit. I learn how to do that in prayer. I salt it, I season my efforts in, in, in my prayer time. That's what makes it happen. Uh, one man will see when we study this element of this is when he talks about dealing with consequences is that many times we think it's that things are really accomplished by our efforts when they're really accomplished in our prayer closets. He said, it's like this. He said, prayer is where the real work is and what you're doing outside your prayer closet is you're just collecting the fruits of what you did in your prayer closet. You're reaping the rewards of what you did in your prayer closet. Prayer is effective. Prayer is effective, it does make a difference. When we're in tune with our Father, when we're talking to our God, God moves. James is that passage we're familiar with when it says, the, faith, the effective prayer of a righteous man, you know, availeth much. I think it's New America says, the effectual prayer of a righteous man accomplishes much. Why? Because that's when God gets in on the scene. Listen to the Amplified version of this from the Amplified New Testament. It says, the effectual prayer, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Amplified says, the earnest, heartfelt, continued prayer of a righteous man makes tremendous power available, and it is dynamic in its working. I believe, after studying prayer for years, when it really gets down to a kind of a bottom line kind of thing, that prayer is faith in action. Because I believe that God is, and I believe that God is, so much is that he is bigger than all things, that there's no mountain that can't be dealt with, there's no ocean that can't be crossed, there's no depth that can't be dealt with, there's no problem that can't be handled through prayer because God is bigger than all of the world around me. We used this passage at the, at the marriage retreat. Remember the one so we talked about that, and Tim introduced it when he talked about, you know, that God, that he that comes to God must believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of those that, here's the passage, diligently seek him. First and foremost, that's the place of prayer. And God's a rewarder of those who pray. That Jesus just said that you have your reward. There'll be a reward for, for your seeking. There's, there's, there's something you'll, be, you'll, you'll experience benefit from if you'll do this and you'll seek God's face and you seek God's faith God's way. But it is a demonstration of faith. I pray because I really do believe God can move, will move. I pray because I really do believe that God is and he's bigger than all these other things. I pray because I trust God and my prayer is evidence that I trust God. Let me put it this way. Let's flip that over. My prayerlessness is a statement that I don't believe God is bigger than these things. Or I don't believe God can really handle it. Or I don't believe God can really be involved in it. And that's demonstrated by my lack of prayer. How often do we get in a real tight situation? Boy, we get on our face, we get on our knees, because we know God is bigger. But it shouldn't just be in those times when it's critical, amen? This should be a walk of our life. You notice on that prayer wall over there, the words over say, I believe. That's a statement that's why we pray. We pray because we believe. We place those prayer wall up there and we put that over it and our prayers go under that I believe. It means God can handle this. God's in charge of this. God's gonna take care of this. God, God knows what needs to be done here. 
I trust you, God. I trust you. Therefore, I'm going to do what you tell me to do. And the first thing you tell me to do is bring them to you. Let your request be made known unto God, the Bible says. So I'm bringing them to you. And it's an evidence that I trust you. Some of you are facing some more deals in your life today. Maybe you've already been praying about them. Or maybe you've been, like some folks do, you're just getting on your knees, but you're just worrying on your knees. Wringing your hands, oh, I'm going to get out of this. I don't know you. But I believe God wants us to get a real grip on what prayer is and what it means to really pray. And the biblical, right, righteous way to meet with God. But we have to be willing to find that secret time, that place where we can spend with God and see what God does. And I believe that we'll see God move in great ways. I'm going to ask the, the, our musicians to come, the band to come. As they begin just to play whatever worship song the Lord has led them to do during this time. This altar, we're going to open it up. Maybe you have your prayer requests there on the bulletin sheet. Maybe you already started pinning out some things, just thinking about the... the